Welcome to our plenary session on Toward an Ideal State, Every Citizen Inspired and Eager to Serve. My name is Yellow Light Breen. I'm your moderator this afternoon. For those of you joining us at the annual volunteer main conference, or those of us who are joining us anywhere, anytime across the world, welcome. We're, we're really pleased to have you. We've got an amazing panel who I'll introduce in a second, and so I'm going to turn it quickly to this conversation um, about this amazing national call to action, Inspired to Serve, and the implications and reactions to that call to action from folks who are working on military, national, state, and local service. First, though, I'm sure that all of the panelists would join me in saying how appreciative we are of the work that those of you who are watching do every single day. I know that you are pushed now to do more than ever, probably with fewer resources than ever, in what has always been a labor of love in terms of running, supervising, and serving uh, with volunteers. So we appreciate everything you do, um, and we're grateful that you're doing it on behalf of our communities and our state. So um, we have an amazing panel, Steve Barney, who is a member of the National Commission on Military and National and Public Service, who will introduce the project and, and really help kick us off. Uh, uh, an attorney, uh, a former Navy man, uh, federal policymaker. Uh, we're thrilled also to have Hannah Pingree, who is the head, as many of you know, of Governor Mills' Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, uh, has served as a state legislator, has served uh, as a leader on a number of community projects in her home community. Welcome, Hannah. We've got Michael Weiskup, who is also a Navy vet, uh, 20 years uh, uh, and, and an officer in the SEALs, and now, in a bizarre twist, um, an athletic director at Colby College here in Maine. Um, and then finally, known to many of you, Mary Alice Crofton, the Executive Director of Volunteer Maine for the last 25 years, um, who can really tie it to the work of national service here in our state. With the theme of Inspired to Serve, I asked each of our panelists to, to give you a sense of, of what their call to service has been. Um, I think like many of you, for me, it's one of those things that I know comes from my family and especially my mother, and it's hard to define. It's one of those things where I just know from an early age there was an expectation that you were going to try to change the world for the better. Maybe part of that was in the hippie back to the land um, culture that intrinsically was trying through their own actions to, to change the systems and culture of how we related to uh, the land and to the community and to each other. Um, and I've tried to carry some part of that ethos with me my whole life. So without further ado, um, I would ask Steve Barney to kick it off and tell us a little bit about this really ambitious project and report. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that uh, this, this, uh, this really incredibly difficult time of this COVID uh, pandemic finds you all well and your families as well. Thanks so much for um, your flexibility and what you've done through this incredibly difficult time to keep service at the forefront, serving our communities serving our state and our country, it's, it's, it's been important. And um, all, all of us fellow citizens, we recognize it. My name's Steve Barney. Uh, I'm joining you from Cape Cod, Massachusetts with uh, beautiful Sandy Neck sand dunes behind me in the background. Um, I grew up in a, in a family in Massachusetts where um, service was kind of the soup that we, that we lived in, you know? Um, and I guess as a kid, I didn't realize how much was going on with my with my mom serving in um, helping helping kids in our local school system with uh, uh, special needs, um, working working on the polls on election day, uh, helping people to vote, uh, working with the PTA, being a docent at a local historic site. My dad, I used to we used to tease him. Um, uh, my dad was a Girl Scout. He headed the 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 local Girl Scout um, uh, chapter and uh, helped. Uh, uh, many young women to uh, to you know develop uh, personally and professionally through Girl Scouting is a tremendous way to serve and to learn about service. For me, uh, after 10 years in high tech, I joined the Navy and served for 22 years as a Navy JAG um, all around the world, and I'm back now in New England, the home that I love. Uh, after getting out of the Navy, I had the privilege to work for uh, five years on Capitol Hill uh, with the Senate Armed Services Committee primarily focused on military personnel policy, but that's also where I um, uh, became involved with this whole uh, National Commission on Military 
national and public service. Um, but following my time in, in the Senate, I returned here to Massachusetts, but was very honored to be nominated by the late Senator McCain to be his commissioner serving on this, uh, this national commission for the last, uh, well, it's gonna be three years uh, coming up uh, at the end of this month. So I'm delighted. So yeah, well, that's my background. Would you like to have me talk a little bit about the commission or shall we let other folks introduce themselves? Yeah, talk a little bit about the commission and then as each of us giant chime in, sure. we'll, we'll each uh, introduce ourselves. Well, thank you. Back in uh, 2016 calendar year, um, the Senate was working on the National Defense Authorization Act. That's the annual piece of legislation that provides the authority for the military departments to uh, organize, train, and equip the forces for, for military service. Um, Senators McCain and Senator Jack Reed of Rhode Island, uh, who are both very passionate about service, uh, came together in a very, very bipartisan way to say, look, we need to take a fresh look at, um, at the issue of service in America. Uh, Senator McCain, as, as many of you know, um, uh, served uh, in, in the military. He served in the House of Representatives of the United States Congress, as well as in the Senate. Um, he was a passionate believer in service. He believed that everybody um, should have an opportunity to serve. He was an extraordinarily strong supporter of AmeriCorps. And uh, I, I really started to learn about AmeriCorps uh, by having him push me into things and say, Steve, you need to take a look at this and, and learn more about it and why, why this is so important. Jack Reed, similarly, with his military background and his service in, in, uh, in, in Congress, uh, tremendous supporter. So they actually put together uh, a, a, um, a study to be done that became this National Commission that did really something that's never been done before. And that is to take a look at three major streams of service. Military service, which you know, I think most of us understand what that is. National service, when we think about programs such as AmeriCorps, uh, uh, the Peace Corps, uh, other wonderful programs that are out there, and then also public service. So we're talking about individuals who hold elected office, uh, appointed to offices in the federal, state, local, and tribal uh, communities. Um, all of these areas were something we were asked to take a look at. So along with 10 other commissioners, um, we started uh, in 2017, calendar year 2017, to begin a process to study all these streams of service with a goal of enhancing and improving the experience of service throughout all the United States. What we learned through this process is that service, it unites us all. It is a, a vital aspect to our, to our nation's security, to its health, its well-being, but its potential is still largely untapped in our country. And so our report, which, is, which was issued on March 25th of this calendar year, 2020, offers both a bold vision and a comprehensive way ahead to increase and improve and strengthen all forms of service in our country. Throughout our process, we, we visited 22 states. We talked to literally hundreds of people, um, organizations. Um, we, we, we talked to people in small towns, uh, big cities, on college campuses, uh, middle schools. And really what we, what we began to do is to put together a story of how we could uh, increase and provide an opportunity to enhance service for all Americans with the idea that service is something that everybody can do. And we wanna try to increase and improve opportunities for people to do it by promoting both of all, first of all, awareness. How can I serve? Um, aspiration. What kind of things might I want to do and then finally give them the, the, the access to serve um, by, by identifying areas that might be potential roadblocks to service and to uh, eliminating or streamlining those to give more people an opportunity to serve. Starting with service as a, uh, something that people would do through um, the K through 12 education process, through service learning programs, through civic education, which became a big part of our report that was not part of our congressional mandate. And then uh, following on from that to explore how they might serve, you know, during their lifetime. Our vision really is that when an individual reaches about the age 18 in our country, if they are asked the question, how will you serve, that they have a ready answer. And they have a ready answer because through K through 12, they've had an opportunity to explore service options and opportunities to, to learn the kind of things that they're good at, the things that excite them 
and to give them service opportunities that will make them want to explore and to build on that service in the future. So our vision is that by 2031, the 70th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's speech asking, asking Americans to serve, that we would begin to see 5 million Americans entering into service every year, including a million in national service programs like AmeriCorps and, and, and other fabulous programs. We have uh, uh, 164 proposals and recommendations that we made in our report. We won't have time to talk about all 164 today, but um, those um, proposals were picked up by um, a group of legislators in the House of Representatives called the Four uh, four country Congress. They introduced those proposals and filed them as a bill. We already have tremendous interest uh, in the House on that. We also have over on the Senate side, um, the CORE Act, which is um, which has been filed by Senators uh, Coons and Wicker. Great bipartisan lineup with those those two tremendous Americans, as well as 17 other co-sponsors. And um, I, I think that as I, as I kind of finish up my, my wrap up of what I've been doing for the last couple of years, um, our, our hope is that in the, the, months to, uh, the months to follow, that we will see many of these ideas, um, first of all, debated by the public, um, uh, looked at hard, and, and hopefully that the, uh, the administration and uh, our national leaders will embrace uh, many of these proposals to give people an opportunity to really explore and to, uh, to, to set us on a new uh, trajectory of service for America. Wow, 164. Well, I know we won't get to them all, but hopefully we'll get into the meat of why it really matters. Uh, I'm going to bump it over to Hannah Pingree and Governor Mills' administration and um, hope to hear what inspires you to serve, Hannah, but also how you take um, this call and, and what you see as the, the opportunities and barriers at the state and local level to bring this work home. Well, thank you, Yellow, and thank you to Steve for that great overview and for your service. Um, as my office actually staffs a number of commissions, and I know that even commissions and boards themselves are a lot of work. And obviously, this report was a major labor of love for all of the commissioners and staff members involved. So thank you. Um, so just personally, I would say uh, I um, grew up on an offshore island off the coast of Maine, um, off the coast of Rockland. Uh, island of 350 people, and I think it's kind of good microcosm of Maine in that a very small town really requires that everybody serve or the vast majority of people serve. So I grew up with, you know, two parents, both who volunteered to be uh, work as EMTs, who both went on the school board. My mom was a volunteer tax assessor, and so I think I think the experience of many Mainers is um, just a kind of almost a requirement living in a small community that you step up and engage. Um, and I think that that, you know, I, when I was a kid, the whole school used to attend town meeting because they needed the teachers there and the kids saw people engaging. And I think that made a big difference in it. You know, it flowed over to the, the bake sales to raise the money for the uniforms and the person who lost their house, the whole pe community pitched in. And I, and I do think that, I think we're lucky to live in Maine in that really that spirit is is strong. Um, and I think it's sort of incumbent upon all of us to sort of, how do we take the small town nature of Maine communities and people sort of feeling that they are responsible for each other and good things that happen in our state and really make that broad. And a lot of it is about service and, and Mary Alice's work, but the really the work of everybody at this conference um, to, to sort of, continue to promote that feeling and it's in a time when when it can be difficult. I mean, certainly service is sometimes connected to politics and that is an area where a lot of people are like, no, don't get me near that, whether it's the school board or the state legislature or Congress. So um, I ran for uh, political office at the age of 23 and was elected when I was 24 and spent eight years in the main legislature. Um, and again, had the great opportunity to just see the importance of, of service um, at, in elected office. And it, again, it's really hard work and a lot of people uh, are not, <laughs> don't love politicians, um, but I saw people on both sides of the aisle just really trying to make a difference and just how important it is that people engage in those positions. Again, at the whether it's the local level or the national level, having good people who care about each other and can listen to each other and you know understand that government and service is about doing good um, is really the, the bottom line. So 
again, that's that's a message that's hard to sort of see through when we're watching political ads and we're you know engaging in national politics right now. But it really is sort of hopefully the core of of what's important. Um, obviously, our state right now is in the middle of an incredibly difficult period um, in terms of this pandemic, and I will say. Um, Mary Alice's work in Volunteer Maine and the work of so many volunteers has been at, more important than ever, but also more difficult than ever. I mean, from the basic needs that people have in our communities from, you know, food needs to child care, um, to people working on the front lines, it really, it's been an incredibly challenging time for people to step up, but also an important time. And this really is a a national disaster and unlike a hurricane it's it's ongoing and has really challenges for service but it's it's more important than ever but i think we have seen people in maine uh really step up so um, i'm excited for the issues of this panel i think that there are um the work that we do in my office um is about long-term planning um we work on issues that are uh, about children in which service and engaging kids in service learning and, and meaningful job experiences while they're in school has really, you know, it's essential for our economy and especially essential for kids um, who are growing up in challenging circumstances. Um, we are working on issues of long-term climate planning and, and one of the uh, proposals that's come out of the Maine Climate Council is a, a service core really dedicated to some of those issues. So it's interesting to see it popping up in other areas. Um, again, we also work on both the economy and, and issues of opioids, and every one of those things requires public engagement and people who care and people who volunteer and step in. So um, again, I'm, I'm excited for this panel, and I'm uh, very uh, enthused by what has come out of this national report, and I, I think this is a really important conversation to be having, uh, especially in such a difficult and politically fraught time, because I think, again, getting back to, you know, we believe most people want to do good and how do we really bring, especially kids, into that important feeling of how do I make a difference? Um, how, how do I do something meaningful? Um, I think that hopefully, hopefully will save us all. So thanks again for inviting me here. Thanks, Hannah. You know, before I uh, move to Mike as well, um, you know, those issues of the aspiration to serve and, um, I think we have talked a lot in recent years about just one, the, the aging of our volunteer corps in a lot of communities, the same 10 people syndrome of <laughs> how do we share the load? And, and then this phenomenon which ebbs and flows but feels like it's um, flowing now, which is, you know, is there um, just a sense that these are especially thankless and especially politicized roles in our communities right now? Are, are there innovations or ways in which the next generation of leaders are engaging that give you hope that, you know, we can make headway against um, those sorts of things. Question for me? Yes. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful right now, even sort of despite the times. I mean, I think, you know, not even getting into the politics of it, I think, you know, Maine, as, as we all know, has a challenging statistics of being among the the oldest, the, 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 being the oldest state in the country. And I think the phenomenon that you've talked about, Yellow, is certainly, certainly something that I've heard throughout my political career that, you know, same people are doing the work. We need young people on boards. We need young people running for office. And I would actually say we are seeing that. You know, we have um, a huge crop of young legislators. Um, I think we've seen a lot of young people starting to become more engaged in community organizations and volunteer work um, in boards. So I, I actually think there are uh, multiple organizations and, and efforts that are happening. I mean, I think even this most recent um, primary election Maine had, there was an issue of, of poll workers and a concern for older workers, older folks who are vulnerable not wanting to work at the polls because they were especially vulnerable to COVID. And uh, we saw a number of towns recruit younger volunteers to serve at the polls, something they had never done before. I mean, I will tell you, the people who work uh, you know, my local town office polling place have been the same people for a long, long time. And some younger people did step up and we saw this in towns across the state. So again, not a partisan job, but a job that required new people to become engaged. And um, so I think that's, that's heartening. And I think we are, you probably could see examples of that happening um, all over the state. 
Um, they're clearly larger political issues that I, you know, climate change that I'm working on where a huge crop of young people are engaged, they're demanding change, they're, they're, you know, writing me letters and coming to meetings and saying, you know, we want something to happen. Uh, issues of racial equality, obviously, we're seeing around the country, young people really becoming more engaged. So I think, you know, taking that engagement and turning it into sort of a long term service ethic is is all of our challenge, but I think it's up to to political leaders to to create those opportunities as well. Wow, I'm I'm fired up and ready to go. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Um, Mike, uh, you know, if you can tell us what inspired you to serve, and and um, there's a big tranche of this report about military service, um, but I think also trying to connect the silos, if you will, to get people who might think they're inspired to serve on the military side to consider some of the civilian opportunities if the military side isn't the right match. But uh, Mike, uh, if you can give us your reactions to, to where this report takes us. Yeah, thank you, y'all. And I'd like to also echo Hannah's um, comments and gratitude towards Steve and the entire commission that put together this effort. Spent so much time traveling the United States trying to figure out all the nuances here. And I think that's, I think that's really important. It's, um, it, these, these are local, opportunities here for volunteerism and be able to connect the community into different ways of service. But there, it's a, it's a national effort. And my experience in the military, um, and then I'll back up, but the exposure I had to so many different people from all walks of life, from all across this country, was one of the defining you know, takeaways and, and developments that I had while serving in the military. And uh, I, I'm so happy to see in this report that that's called out explicitly that service is a way to bring down barriers to create familiarity between people to get to know each other because I think in the absence of knowing each other, it's much easier to have contempt or hate or disregard and those organizations that can bring people from diverse backgrounds, socioeconomic, you name it. Um, I think need to be amplified and encouraged. And, you know, when we think about our individual development, especially of our youth, you know, educating them broadly, this is a major facet, I think, of their development into becoming better citizens. I, I've been inspired to serve, I think, since, you know, since I was born. I, I never really had this aha moment because my parents were public servants and my grandparents were public servants. And so it was, it was the family business. It was just what we did. And my mom was a nurse for 55 years, uh, born and raised here in Wyndham. Um, my, her mother was a teacher in the school system in Wyndham for years. Her father used to you know, drive, the, um, drive the horses and, uh, and pack down the snow during the winter with the big rollers before we had snow plows. And in the summers, he'd work in the mills. Um, on my father's side, they were farmers. My grandmother was, was a teacher as well. My father was enlisted in the army in the early 50s. Uh, and then he had an over 30 year career as a public health advisor in the, in the CDC. And so growing up, it was, I just always was around people that served. Like that was their career. And I believe that is my, my career, you know, despite you know, now not being in the military and, and working in higher education, my mission hasn't changed fundamentally. You know, in the military, my job I, that I, I took um, enormous pride in and focused on wasn't just the accomplishment of our tasks and our national defense strategy, but it was to create, make our sailors into better citizens. And now, you know, at Colby College, I can continue that mission and help students become better citizens. Because I know certainly in the last 20 years of my service um, in uniform, it's made me a much better man. It's made me a much better husband. It's made me a much better citizen and a, a better neighbor now that I want to settle down. But it was tough. When you're in the military, you're behind, the, you're behind walls, behind gates, and you're actually not connected to your community anymore. You travel away from your neighborhoods and where you grew up and you're deployed around the world to remote locations. And about halfway through my career, I realized I had this enormous disconnect with the very people I was sworn to protect and defend. 
the whole reason I existed. And, you know, for my friends and, and other, uh, you know, you know, military, you know, members, they're voting an absentee back to their home districts, but they're not able to vote in where their kids go to school. And, you know, there's, you end up becoming a much smaller group isolating itself. And this report calls that out as well, which, which it was nice to see that fewer and fewer military folks are coming from non-military families. It, it is becoming literally the family business. And that's not, that's not healthy. You know, that's not going to increase the representation in our military that we need, that diversity that we need. And for me, I had to seek that out and find ways to connect myself back into the community. And I did that through partnering with Camp Sunshine here in Casco, Maine. Uh, and I, I needed something. I, maybe it's that midlife or mid-career crisis that we all go through at some point. I just needed a better reason why. And service in the military wasn't enough. And I needed to see who I was serving and be able to contribute to them. And, uh, and so when I see this report, I, I, I want to find those, those ways to remove the obstacles, to create these avenues that make it easier, make it more familiar, make it where people can see a pathway forward and they don't have to go find it and search for it. Um, because oftentimes that's just not gonna happen unless there's some um, something that instigates them, some kind of like spark that gets them going, but we can't wait for that to accidentally happen. We need to create the opportunities and bring them in. So for me, you know, how could there have been a program to, to connect me into my community in a service way instead of me having to find Camp Sunshine? I'm grateful to find it, but can we reverse the flow? Can we bring our, our, our you know, you know, men and women that are from, you know, Maine that are deployed around the world and connect them back into our community because they probably don't feel connected as, as much as we think they are. Um, so I'm enormously proud that, you know, that our country has taken this step and, and made this commission. Now I'm really excited to, to see what we can actually do to implement it and execute it, which, you know, that's the next most important step. Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, this, this notion of reconnecting military, we see a lot of activity in our state and everywhere about reconnecting um, retiring military to gainful employment, which you've obviously done exceptionally well. But this idea of reconnecting them to the community um, is another angle that I don't think has gotten as much conversation. There are two angles in the report that I think are significant. One is a reinforcement that we have so many people who think they want to serve in the military but um, can't meet the standards. And we've seen in groups like Ready Nation and A Stronger America, a lot of current and retired military leaders pushing for work on early childhood uh, development and um, other uh, long-term pathways just to have 18 and 20 year olds that can serve. Um, I don't know, Mike and Steve, if you could speak to that. And then secondly, um, I think this idea that if they still show up with an aspiration of military service, but it's not the right fit for any number of reasons, how do you redirect that passion into a civilian service opportunity when people show up at the military store? Yeah, um, yeah well, that's, that's really a, a great point. You, you're right, um, only about a little less than 30% of the demographic of the American, American uh, population that's between ages 18 and 26 meet the current standards to go into the military. Um, there's more that we can do, I think, to prepare people to, 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 to increase that number and also to increase the number of the propensity to serve for people within that demographic. But um, during one of, the, one of the engagements we had with our, uh, with our commission was to meet with the Department of the Army. The Army always has challenges in their recruiting mission. They meet with terrific young people who, who will walk into those uh, armed forces recruiting offices in strip malls all over every, every state uh, of the union. And, and some of them um, have a heart to serve. They'd like to go in the military. They talk to a recruiter and then they learn they're not gonna be able to meet those standards. The thing that was really encouraging about our discussion with the military and the army was they, they view as we do the opportunity to, to say, well, look, um, this is not a dead end 
for you to explore service. There are other great service opportunities in the, in the national service community. So um, I, I'm committed, even after this commission comes to an end this month, to working with AmeriCorps and with the Department of the Army to find ways to do a warm handoff between that recruiter so that, um, so that they can be handed off to someone who can help meet a need for service either in a local community or in an international program of, of national service. Um, as, as, as Michael said, there's, there's just so many minor obstacles that are out there that can be overcome if we take a holistic view towards promoting service and looking to ways to, to eliminate obstacles for terrific people who can bring their own unique skills and to serve their communities. I, I, I'd add on to that. I mean, one thing that I find you know, frequently now in terms of when I mentor and provide advice to young men and women that are looking at the military as an option, I often find that the military probably isn't where they should be. You know, the, the government is a, is, has got a number of, an, of, of fantastic pathways, whether it's in the FBI, whether it's in um, Homeland Security, whether it's in State Department, and just all of them have their own, you know, great opportunities, their own institutional department cultures, their own mission. And I often find that one of those resonates maybe better than the military, but the military seems to be the most obvious one, you know, and, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you create service centers that aren't just specific to DOD, but and a person can walk in the door and it's serviced broadly. And there's representatives and there's knowledge broadly. Because if you only know one person in the military, chances are that might be the branch that you go into, but there's just so much more out there and just educating them on the alternate courses and where they can go, I think would be really great. If I could, there's so many recommendations in the report that speak to those things. One of them being um, expanding as part of career ed, the youth groups and, and so forth that, that do make people aware of the opportunities in the military for more than um, the, the warfare side of things. Uh, and, and also looking at um, you know, the career prep and how the cyber side of things and, and everything else can be supported and grown in that uh, in terms of, of awareness. And I, although there's a part of me that goes one more platform will make me crazy, <laughs> uh, Steve, <laughs> if, if you are finally able to meld into a, an online platform, the, the national service, and the military service and the public service opportunities. Uh, there's a lot that is pointed out. And you, as you read the report, you realize that someone in the state of Maine uh, had access to that same conversation about how to remove the barriers and bring them down because some of what is discussed in there, it used to be part of the state hiring system and is not. You can watch it go away right now. But still finding the opportunities uh, are, are difficult. And if that is possible to bring together those military national service and public service opportunities so somebody can go and say, you know, this is my interest. I'm interested in graphic arts and find all the ways that is used uh, to present reports, to, you know, visualize data, to do all of those sorts of things would be really useful. The other, piece of it for that I saw that I found really um, hopeful is that somebody recognized at a national level that veterans coming into national service have barriers. That it's not a smooth transition and partly because, uh, first of all, the, the support for somebody to serve in national service versus what it was in the military is so far reduced it's just barely above the poverty level. And so the proposals to bring it up to 175% um, of poverty, is those, those are really important to, to move so that folks can come back in, use those talents, apply them, 
find their place in the community and in intensive service because one of the things that folks have talked about is that sense of team uh, like in the vet corps out in Washington state and some of the, that sense of team to be able to bring that into the civilian world as you transition from behind those gates uh, out is really, is really important to do, but they usually are coming with family and other obligations that make uh, less than a thousand dollars a month, not reasonable for a full-time service sort of thing. And this, there's a lot, in there, the civic engage, uh, civic education piece. Um, Steve, I'd love you to talk about the what the commission heard and how that that wasn't part of your mission. But how did it get there? It was fr it was thrust on us, you know, as we as we went out and we talked to folks. Our 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 mission for our commission was first of all to, to look at these three forms of service: military, national, and public, in a holistic way. It was also um, I want to mention that another one was to take a look at the military's selective service registration system and to answer the question of whether all Americans, both men and women, should be required to register for the selective service. Um, that is included in our report. Our, our commission recommended that all Americans should be, um, should be required to serve. Um, but as we, as we talked around this, um, Mike, you, you you alluded to it about this, this sort of a cultural leveling process that's associated with service and a value of service. When we're talking to things like to folks um, about the selective service system and how that relates to like a draft, we talked to people who were drafted in, um, in, um, uh, during the, the Vietnam War. Um, some who served on active duty in the military, they did their minimum service, they got out. Some who remained on active duty and served full careers. Others who were conscientious subjectors who performed a nationally recognized alternative form of service and provided valuable service to our nation as, as, as a civilian. The main thing that we took away from this was how, how serving with others on something that is bigger than you brings people together who would not ordinarily be, be working alongside each other. You might not be friends but you learn from each other, you learn to respect each other, um, you gain a new appreciation for, for just kind of the richness of, of, of our country and, and the people that make our country so, so wonderful. That includes both the people who were born here and the people who come, come here because, because they want to be part of the, the, the American experience. So um, that civic education thing just came up again and again saying, look, we need to do more to enhance civic education in America. We need to, to um, invest in civic education. Our report recommends that Congress appropriate $450 million a year to improve civic education and service learning in K through 12. Um, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of money. Um, it's, it's not something that, um, that uh, states and local governments can easily come up on their own. It would require a significant national investment. But what we're talking about with investing in civic education and service learning at a national level is only about 5% of what we already invest in, in what we call STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, learning how to be part of this America and to be, and to be included in, in the richness of what America is all about through understanding your, your rights, your, your responsibilities, and your opportunities as a citizen Many of us think that's, that's at least as important as developing the next generation of, of super technical learners. We're doing that well. We, we need to do it better. But gosh, we could do an awful lot more in developing citizens. And so that means we do need to, to open up the opportunity windows for people to explore and to learn. Um, uh, Hannah, when you talked about you know, growing up on a small island in Maine, you're absolutely right. When we visited small towns, my favorite town in, in Texas I visited had a population of 260. Everybody there was part of serving their community because that's, that's how the community survives. That's how it thrives. And that's why they're really proud of what they do. And you had the privilege to grow up in a, a small community and see how that, that works. We need to expand that kind of opportunity for folks to, to learn through civic education to, to figure out where they fit into this. Um, and, and then as, we, as they get ready to transition, um, 
I'm a big supporter of the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. It is a standardized test. It's offered in many states. What it does really well is it helps individuals to understand and to learn what they are, what they are skilled at, what kind of gifts and talents they, they have. I, I once had a great boss who was sitting down with me in a performance review thing and asked the inevitable question, what do you think you do well? What do you think you don't do well? And when I got to the think you don't do well stuff, of course, I, I was able to make up a couple of things. And, um, and he said, what do you intend to do about that? And I said, well, work harder on those. He says, why don't you just focus on the things you really do well? And, and that's kind of where, where I, I go with this, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. And, and they have a, a career exploration tool that's fabulous. Young people who take this test have an opportunity to learn what kind of skills they have. I'm a big supporter of tying that into um, federally insured student loans. I would love for everybody who wants to go and, and get a federally insured student loan to also take the AVSVAB test to make sure that when they're making a commitment to a time in their life and resources to, to pursue higher education, that they really know what they're good at and that it gives them an opportunity to succeed, to graduate on time and to move on into a career that's rewarding to them and to their families. Um, we need to look at ways to eliminate some of the barriers right now to entering into public service. Um, part of what we have uh, recommended in our program is to do some things to clean up the federal government's um, entry level service, enhance the ability for people to get into valuable uh, internships. We've recommended that people who work uh, as interns on Capitol Hill should also be paid for the work that they do. Um, and the idea is not to make it harder for those people to serve, but to give everybody an opportunity to serve. As we traveled around, we learned there's a lot of terrific people doing service who could not go into service uh, uh, to their communities, except for the fact that they've got a family that stands behind them and, and, and supports them and is prepared to support them financially. Going into national service should not require a vow of poverty. That's why our report recommends taking a fresh look at some of the benefits that are there, eliminating the taxation of the, uh, of the education award, um, uh, increasing the, the stipend to, to make it a living wage. When I spoke at the group of, um, with a group of young people who were um, going to City Year in Boston as part of the big AmeriCorps um, kickoff, um, gosh, it was like a year ago, September, I wanna say, um, um, I learned from them that one of the first things they did when they reported for duty was they all got together and they filled out their paperwork so that they could get, um, um, you know, food assistance, food stamps. This isn't right. Um, we want to encourage people to serve. We need to remove those obstacles to service so that people can find and to explore and to benefit from service. There are two things in our conversation that, that really strike me. One is how privileged the five of us are. And I mean, in this context, privileged to have such deep examples in our own households to set the model and the inspiration to service. And it reminds me a lot of the conversations about mentorship where so many of us have informal mentors that it's hard for us to internalize and appreciate the lack of those mentors sometimes in others' lives. Um, and I, I dare say, so creating that, the mentoring and learning opportunities that you were just talking about, Steve, for those that where it's not built in especially. I'm sure there's a lot of educators in the audience listening to this saying, um, yeah, all that sounds great, but how do we um, put this new push for civic education on top of all the other demands and expectations on us and our classrooms and our schools? I dare say it's got to be something that can be integrated and holistic in what our schools are trying to do rather than a new add-on. Do, do any of the four of you have thoughts about how we can actually make that happen, you know, in, in the midst of all the other um, agendas and, and goals that, uh, that educators are being asked to pursue. Well, I mean, I was going to even add, I mean, I've really, um, Steve, the recommendation in the report about the $450 million to the state specific ed education is really exciting, and, but it's, it isn't all about money. It is sort of how do we integrate service learning and experiences for kids into all of our work. And I think there are, there are a lot of schools in Maine who do a great job with this, but I think how do we um, continue to highlight it? And I think, I think really for, for, for moderate and low income kids who, you know, who their parents during college, they can't let them have an unpaid internship or during high school, they get an experience that's paid that is valuable and connects them to service. I mean, I think that is, 
Um, that's actually something that came out in the state's economic plan. It's a goal of the children's cabinet. Um, I think it's something that is probably, uh, you know, we are seeing during this pandemic, um, youth rates of, of depression and, you know, uh, fear of suicide being, you know, higher than ever. So I think this idea of connecting kids to meaningful experiences through internships and service learning, um, through meaningful job experiences, which is really a lot about mentors and sort of seeing what the world has to offer. I mean, it's probably never been more important. So in a way, I think when we think about economic recovery and we think about, you know, kids whose, whose lives have been fundamentally shifted the last year, I think this conversation um, for, you know, kids of all ages, but especially middle and high school students, it, it's probably never been more important. So. Um, I, I would say, I think for all of us, you know, certainly working in the governor's office, a, a lot of the work that we do on a variety of issues should come back to this, you know, from economic rebuilding to concern about substance abuse um, to, you know, after school programs, it, it really should be, I think this kind of work will, will I think, be meaningful kid, to kids and, and inspiring. Same thing for, for kids in college and, and beyond. I mean, obviously, we know we all need this in our lives, but how do we really support it for, for students who, who might not have access to it otherwise because their parents are busy and, and not connected in this way? So, I mean, I think this is a good challenge and, and really it has to be infused into, into all of our work and all of our government programs. And I think we are starting to do that at the state level just sort of this recognition. I mean, the Department of Corrections in Maine is doing some amazing work trying to, you know, uh, get kids who, who are at risk of being incarcerated to connect to meaningful peer opportunities, meaningful work opportunities, meaningful service opportunities. And, and these are really, you know, kids who, who could have, um, with this kind of experience, could be inspired to take a totally different path. So I know that was part of the report, sort of looking at these opportunity youth. Um, but I think that, you know, again, whether Clearly, service through AmeriCorps, the military, that's sort of the, an amazing ideal that if everybody in our country could have that experience, um, we'd probably be in a very different direction right now as a country, but at least starting in, in small ways while kids, um, we have main kids in school, I, I think is an important start. So, well, I think, uh, when You were talking earlier, Mary Alice, it made me think of the recommendation about having a cybersecurity reserve corps when you were talking about different types of skills and different types of image of national and, and national security service. Um, I'm curious, you know, we think about technology right now, sometimes negatively in terms of a platform that, you know, amplifies criticism and kind of the downsides of, of public um, and governmental service. But, you know, how do each of you see technology as a tool to do some things in tackling these challenges that we may not have had before. Uh, where, where does technology become an enabler now for the, these kinds of sets of recommendations, um, you know, even though it's got some downsides? Well, in, in national service and also in, in a broader volunteer world, it allows folks who may have been blocked from serving because of transportation or mobility or some other, some other issues to, as, as the volunteer programs figure out how to pivot to allow this kind of service. Um, it allows folks to, to participate who might not have been able to do that as easily in the past. Um, it also, I think, you know, going back to service learning because it's a teaching methodology um, that unfortunately is not part of the curriculum for teacher prep in the state of Maine. But um, when, when it's infused as the methodology and you put it with text so that students can begin to interview the folks on the planning board, the folks uh, in the town office and that sort of thing, especially in those places where the office is part-time or uh, the planning board members or whatever are volunteers and begin to understand what those roles are and that they are volunteers learning to act on their community. They can do their research without some of the transfer. I mean, one of the big, when we had service learning money and we were actually doing the funding of service learning projects around the state, it was all about the transportation cost. Yes. And it was all about the after school hours that were needed in order for the students to be able to go out and meet with people. 
I think the technology will make service learning um, when it's used to show mastery of the academic content, it'll allow students to work together in groups and reach out and learn about the community and learn how to act on it and within it. And that's really where the start of that civic education is. If you see something in your community, understanding what your options are, who's involved, who can give you info, and it's not going to be restricted to food drives anymore, community gardens, those sorts of things. It can take on some bigger policy issues, I think. One of the things we haven't talked about a lot uh, in this session is what's the role of a private sector and business community in this challenge? Um, you know, I know from their perspective, many businesses um, are too small to really have really robust internship programs, let alone sometimes to, to lean into these, you know, collaborations in the community. But we also know that a lot of our, our deepest workforce challenges are counting right now on much tighter business education collaborations than ever before. Um, what, what's the role of the private sector in this? What's the role of businesses and employers in this to, to make any of this happen? Yeah, well, if I, uh, oh, go ahead, Mary Alice. Please. <laughs> I haven't talked about national service. I'd be killed if I don't. Um, no, you know, there's already, um, uh, a close relationship between the private sector and, and AmeriCorps and Senior Corps in the state because it's a, it's a cost share mechanism. People inappropriately talk, it about, uh, talk it, uh, about it as a match. It's not really. It's sharing kind of like Cooperative Extension and some others at the federal, state, and local level. And in that, the opportunity for the small businesses, um, and one of the things that uh, the report pointed out is that if we can get a federal policy change, there's a, a bigger opportunity for those businesses to be able to, to bring their expertise to the table and create, as somebody serves, uh, train those folks who are serving so that they have the skills when they leave as, uh, as the carpenter, uh, skilled trades, other sorts of things. Uh, community health workers, mental health workers, any number of things. But while they're doing their service, they are prepping for that. And they can learn from those folks who are set up as uh, independent businesses, you know, self-employed, whatever, uh, in sharing their, their skills on a training level. There's tons of opportunity there. And then, Steve, I'll let you talk. <laughs> well, first of all, I appreciate you pointing out and, and and with your wealth of knowledge on this you know there is already this very strong relationship in national service with with the private sector it's a valuable one and um, as we traveled around one of the things that we heard from large employers um, is that um, the workforce that they are trying to attract for their future growth is already uh, motivated to serve and as a matter of fact many many of those young people who are who are coming up in their careers are faced with this idea of, you know, can I go into service or do I need to pursue a career? And they haven't yet had the opportunities to explore how to, how to merge those, those two things together. So uh, many employers to become employers of choice, they wanna create opportunities for, for, um, for their employees to, to serve in the communities by creating um, uh, opportunities to take the skills that they learn on the job and apply them um, both in their local communities and internationally. Uh, um, when, when, I, when I visit large food banks, for example, um, I'm always impressed by, you know, there's, there's a big group of people that are from a local company or local organization that are there spending the day helping, many times with AmeriCorps, volunteer, uh, AmeriCorps members alongside them, teaching and, and instructing them how to do it, um, helping them to manage the operations of, of the food banks. So that becomes incredibly important. So um, yeah, I think that there is a great opportunity for the private sector to be involved here. And, and, I, and I come back to, you know, my, my roots in New England, and I think about the state of Maine, and, 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 and I realize that, that the majority of, of people who are serving in their community, especially as volunteers, are people who are in small business, or they're in the trades. They're, they're, they're earning their living in that local community. They're part of the community. They're a volunteer firefighter or an EMT. They're providing other services. Um, 
And, and so a big part of what, what we need to do, and, and it gets back to Hannah's point about how $450 million is, is, is a pretty good seed money, but it, it doesn't solve all the challenges, especially of, of rural communities in the state of Maine, where the distance um, to be covered um, can be such a challenge. That's where technology clearly does have a role. That's where creating a, a fellowship program where an individual could apply for a fellowship and, and, and if they are selected and they qualify, they take that, you know, they take a, a little piece of paper that says, I've been qualified for a fellowship and now I can take that to a service organization in my local community. And what I will get from that is, as the, the person participating in service, I get the opportunity to learn from people in my community how they serve, what the things are that they're doing, what the priorities of the community are. The organization in the community doesn't have to come up with the money to, pro to provide for the, the, the care and support of that individual who is serving. And the people of the community get the value of having an increased um, service capability that is, that is meeting the needs of the community, whether it's individuals coming into the school system, Hannah, to work alongside teachers who are already so busy trying to do the things that are, they're asked to do in a school day, but to help them to do the things to, to expand and to integrate things like service learning. Mike, you were trying to jump in a minute ago, so I wanted to come back to you. And... Yeah, it, just the thought occurred to me, you know, this um, cooperation between the service components and private sector. So as a tradi transitioning military member, you know, what are the avenues to help me transition into the state of Maine? How do I what is the transition assistant program in the military? And for the military, it's a fairly large kind of one solution fits all. And that's not, that doesn't work. Um, an organization here in the state of Maine called Boots to Roots has taken a local approach to how to bring service members specifically into Maine and get them into Maine jobs and know the Maine employers and what they're looking for and help to craft resumes with the with the twist that is going to resonate here in Maine. And, you know, so we're one off ramp here is for when people are in part of these national, you know, uh, service organizations, how do we, how, how do we get them here to Maine where they're already going to want to continue this service? They're going to want to work and they're going to have, they're going to help with our familiarity of all the different programs that are available and help to mentor in our locals and so, local areas. And so bringing, let's, let's get the best from America and bring them here that already have this um, desire. And, but there needs to be something that marries the two up because my skills on paper don't translate well into the private sector. And, you know, my ability to, to land successfully here at Colby College was specifically because people took a chance on me and gave me an opportunity and were willing to allow me to transition. And it's taken me two years and I'm still in that process. But how do we help encourage uh, these other private sector companies and be able to pair those up? I think that's, that, that's worth the effort. Thanks for that, Mike. The, um, what I've heard from a lot of larger employers in Maine who attract talent from all over the country and the world is that community service is one of the ways to make it sticky. Right. One of the ways they keep them from jumping to the next uh, career ladder out of state afterwards. And so that's, it's a way that we keep them here. We've got a couple of minutes left and I'm sure it's not lost on the audience because Mary Alice likes to stay behind the scenes that she was the only one who didn't really tell us what inspired you to serve. So in our closing minutes, I want you to answer that question, Mary Alice, and then I'll, I'll try to take us out and wrap us up. Well, I'll do 30 seconds. My mother was a World War II Marine. Um, and uh, so that meant she did not, she, <laughs> she enlisted. She was a staff sergeant. Uh, and, uh, and then my dad was the one who was in, he also served, but uh, um, he was the one who was involved in local politics. And at six years old, the uh, uh, high hopes for Jack Kennedy's uh, is ingrained in my head because it was on the speaker phone that we went around the neighborhoods with the car. Um, and I didn't, <laughs> I was a poll watcher at uh, 12. So in the times it was there, 
But I, there's a couple of things I do. I have my eye, so I'll take 30 seconds apiece to, to just sort of talk about um, with AmeriCorps because that's a big part of what the commission does. And we know that 50% of the folks who serve in Maine in AmeriCorps um, come from away and half of those folks stay. It is a proven protective factor, whether you're talking about America's promise, youth development, whatever else, that being engaged in your community solving issues not only is, uh, gives you a feeling of competence, but gives you a tie to the community that then becomes a protective factor for a lot of different things. And I spent 15 years in substance abuse prevention and, and it was um, you know, one of those things proven over and over again. And that there, there are, one of the things that's a, that hampers us in Maine is that things come to Maine and national service in AmeriCorps based on population. So one of the things the commission has been trying to do and got stymied because, you know, the philanthropic world pivoted a few months ago was developing a main, uh, main service fellow core to do, to take what Steve was talking about and make it real right now, as soon as we could in Maine to solve some of the issues without the federal regulation of what you can do, what you can't do and that sort of thing. And we know that if we can bring those folks in um, Maine is very marketable to, for national service. If we can bring folks in, they will stay because they are now showing up not only in the legislature, but the, they're the town manager and uh, in Lisbon and in Vinyl Haven, they are showing up as executive directors of nonprofits and in businesses all over the place. Uh, they, they do become the leaders and this is a movement that's only 25 years old. So many of them are just, you know, in their early to mid forties right now. Um, it's an important, an important piece to keep moving. I know Thanks, my Mary Alice. No, that was, uh, that was amazing. Um, each of us is inspired to serve. I know everyone watching this is inspired to serve. And the question is, how do we make sure we achieve that ideal that every citizen is inspired and eager to serve and that for them, we close those gaps of awareness, aspiration, and access to make that possible. Um, we've had an amazing panel. Thanks so much to Steve, Hannah, Mike, and Mary Alice. Um, I could listen to smart, committed people like this all day, and I know you could too. So if I had an applause track, I would play it now. Um, but thank you for being part of uh, the Volunteer Main Annual Conference. Thank you for listening into this plenary session. And thanks again to our panel and to the National Commission for this great catalytic work. Thank, Thank you, you, Yellow. Thanks, Yellow. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.